morning session today. It's our first time by Kindler. It's, I believe, a very fresh result. <laughs> yeah. Uh, didn't completely get out of the oven yet, but. Uh, so hi, good morning. Um, yeah, so let's see if I can pronounce everything in the title. This is a polynomial Bogolyubov result uh, in SL2 uh, of the of finite fields, uh, FQ. Um, did I say two? SLN, FQ. Well, no, the board is correct. Uh, yeah, and this is joined with Shai and the norm. So I didn't manage to say everything. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so this line of work originates, or at least uh, at least that's what I'm told. It's in French uh, by Bogolyugov from 39. And uh, I think the latest is Sanders from 2012. Uh, so the question or the problem that we'll study that they're studying is the following. You have a subset of F Q to the N, Q maybe prime say, and N a large number. Uh, so this is a set of density uh, alpha. And you want to uh, study the structure of what happens when you add and, uh, and subtract A from itself. Uh, so here is a theorem. Uh, if you take A minus A plus A and again minus A, the order doesn't matter. It's a, a billion, but it's foreseeing the future. Uh, this contains shadow con contains a, a subspace v if you think of this as a vector space uh, of co-dimension which is uh, something like one over a alpha to the fourth power um, so yeah, uh, that's the um, abelian version. Uh, sorry, uh, this is Q. Q and P O. Mention one of the after the four. I think the I think it's called dimension, and and this is alpha. Then. Uh, yeah, so if the dimension is small, the co-dimension is large. It's a small sub. Oh, sorry. Okay. Log. This is Sandals. Okay. Yeah, okay. Maybe I should have said uh, this in the beginning. I'm sure there are people who know this thing is much better than me. Here. Um, the four is outside the one. Yeah. <laughs> o is you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, fine. And this is like a quasi polynomial uh, Bogolyubov -Bog result because the, the density uh, of the subspace, the relative density uh, in, inside uh, this group is a quasi polynomial in the density of the original set A. And it's interesting to improve this uh, to get a polynomial density in the density of A. Uh, uh, and uh, they will do it, but not in that group. We do it in a different group. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so think of P, which is actually Q, Q as a large uh, constant, maybe. And n 
much larger than that going to infinity that I think that's the good uh, parameters that one should uh, consider uh, and we uh, consider a, a similar problem on a uh, SLN you um, I'll, I'll tell you what the, this uh, group is. Uh, it's it's not a billion, uh, and because it's not a billion, it comes with more power. Like multiplication is somehow more powerful in on a billion sets than, uh, and therefore we can get a better result. But it also comes with uh, more responsibility because non abelian <laughs> groups uh, come with representation theory and representation theory is an old and huge subject that was studied at least from the beginning of the 20th century uh, so I, I won't need a, a, a lot today and I guess you are not going to be surprised if I tell you that the results that we need from represent, representation theory we just used a result that already existed, but what may surprise you <laughs> is that they existed only in the last few years. Uh, these are new <laughs> results uh, in representation theory. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, this group first. Uh, let's say, and a few, this is a subgroup of GLN FQ, which is a subset of just matrices, and by a matrices over the field uh, FQ. Uh, this is, uh, I, th I think of this as an, uh, a billion a group. Uh, GLN FQ, so this is just a set of matrices, you can add uh, them uh, and subtract. Uh, GLN FQ, you can multiply, these are the invertib invertible matrices, so you can multiply and you can uh, do the opposite of multiplying, whatever that is. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, uh, invertible matrices. And those are matrices which are invertible, but also have the terminant one. Um, and maybe we'll need that uh, intuition later. So I'll just say the number of matrices here, just all matrices, it's Q to the N squared. And uh, the number of matrices here, it's uh, not much uh, different. It's whatever we had before divided by maybe Q squared or something like that. Uh, and the size of this group uh, is smaller than that, of course, but also not very much. It's, uh, it's GL, it's whatever you have in GLM uh, divided by Q or Q minus one, because you can have all, all kinds of determinants, uh, but you only uh, fix uh, one. Okay, uh, so yeah, so invertible uh, the determinant one matrices and the main theorem is that uh, if A is a subset of this group uh, of density that is at least uh, Q to the C and squared, so uh, yeah, minus here. Uh, I write C to mean that there's some global constant for which this holds, and uh, this constant will always be C, but it will always di be different than the other constant. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so Q to the minus C n squared means the density can be as low as polynomially small in the size of the group. Uh, then, if you take A, A, and the inverse of A and also A, and then the inverse of A and you multiply them all. So this is all the inverses of elements in A. Uh, then this 
contains a subgroup of density. Uh, let me say, let me call it G of density uh, that is at least. Uh, Okay, mu of A is the relative density of A, like the, uh, something between zero and one, actually greater than Q to the minus C n squared. Uh, and this is a global constant. So therefore a polynomial Bogolubov result. And uh, I can say more, I can say uh, something about the structure of, of, how, uh, of G. So moreover, Uh, G is of the form uh, um, G equals, okay, C, hopefully, times LK, LK and C to the minus one. Well, so it is the adjoint of uh, LK, LK is a subgroup of, uh, uh, of SLN uh, Q. Uh, uh, so this is just an element in the group. Not be the first one to lie down, uh, to write on the board. Yeah, and, and LK is a very simple, well, simple is a charge term, but an easy to describe a subgroup of a SLN Q. Uh, LK consists of all the matrices that have a K by K, K, by K identity matrix and then zeros and then whatever here. So X. X can be anything uh, from well. GL n minus K. SL. Not GL, SL. SL, SL n minus K uh, of FQ because I gives one to the determinant. So to get overall one, you, get, you need a matrix from SL. Uh, n minus k in this case. So yeah, so LK is not just a nice to describe a subgroup, it's actually a homo homomorphic, isomorphic. isomorphic, thank you, to, a, to the same type of group that we started with. Um, so, I want to name uh, this. Uh, so I'll start by just saying that, um, let, let's, let's understand what LK is. LK is the set, it stabilizes the vectors E1 up to EK in two ways. If you multiply it by E1 to EK from the right, they remain E1 to, to EK, and so and also from the left. So these are actually 2K constraints on LK. Uh, so from uh, both sides. Um, so something like C, LK, C minus one, stabilizes uh, a other vectors in the same way, right? Whatever you, whatever you need to put here to get E1 up to EK. Uh, and also it's a group, right? It's an adjoint of a group, it's a group. We call it, we didn't focus group it yet, but we call it a, uh, 2K good, because it's good, a Groom-Virat. 
because it's both an umvirat, it is, you know, you decide if you're in the set by looking at a set of K constraints and seeing if they are satisfied. So it's an umvirat of two K constraints, but it's also a group. So that's a group, group um, Wait, Guy, before, before you erase, I see you're about to erase this board. And I'm gonna ask you a question that I should have asked much earlier. Okay. So what was the point of you writing these conclusions on the bottom? Like they're not uh, just was it just yeah, like so, SLNFQ so for now it's just okay. Through. So for now it's just so you know if you want some intuition about what what SLN is, and maybe you're more familiar with the uh, just so, make, so on the left, I thought you were saying that this is a like the additive group, and then on the right it's like an applicative. No, so I, I said that the set of matrices I, I think of it as, a, as a, an, an additive group. Uh, because uh, like uh, it, it's not a group uh, uh, with respect to uh, multiplication, but here it is a group with respect to multiplication. So here it is a multiplicative group. The, the group action is multiplying two matrices. So then I shouldn't be able to get intuition for the multiplicative group. I think about the additive group. Right? That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe we'll get to that. Yeah. In theory, there is no intuition. Like yeah. So this has nothing to do with that. On the face of it. Okay. Yeah. So, guy, can you explain why this is obviously false for GLN? <laughs> uh, no. It's not false for GLN. It's, for, uh, it's just easier to work with SLN. Yeah. GLN works the same with. The, the difference is that GLN has some annoying characters that SLN doesn't. Have. That's. That's why I'm working with SLM. Does it matter that the C's are in SLM or GLM? Uh, no, no. Uh, do the C's change? Not the C, sorry. I don't know what this character is. C? One C? C. Let's yeah. call it C. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this C, uh, no, if you're. The same if it's in GLM. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. Right, they, they don't affect the right. So GLN has these SLNs embedded in it uh, exactly because of this reason, and that's why it's sort of enough to just talk about SLN. Maybe these access will be taken from the question. Okay. Uh, right. Let's just think of SLN. It's, it's, uh, interesting enough, I think. Oh, uh, so I said, uh, yeah, so I said what a 2K good groove, yeah, groove right, is. Uh, I think I need a little more. So, um, so if I look at the double corset, so I multiply LK maybe from C on the left and by C from the right. Uh, so this is again, a, a set of 2k constraints. It's just that they are not on the same vector, uh, not on the same vectors, and it's not uh, about fixing them. They are changing them, but still it's a constraint. So this is a 2k good uh, umvirate. Uh, okay, I think I said everything that I need about these uh, subgroups of SL and FQ. Uh, so, let's talk about how to prove this Bogolyugov result. Um, so the proof scheme has, uh, I don't know, I think four steps, let's see. Uh, so the first, is not really doing anything, it's just a definition. Uh, we are going to prove things for global subsets. Uh, so I need to tell you what a global subset is. There are various definitions that we use, I'll just uh, uh, write one. So A, a subset of SLN Q is say, our global if, uh, on any k umvirate 
So I, tell, I told you what a good Uber rate is. I didn't tell you what a K Uber rate is, which is maybe not so good, but uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, the relative density of, I mean, you can imagine what this uh, might be. Uh, the relative density of A is doesn't think, so if you, if you add constraints, you go into a subset of SLNQ, uh, SLNQ uh, the density does not grow by too much. So it's bounded by R to the K times the ori original density of A. Uh, so that's a definition. And then once you know what a global set is, uh, then you can aim to prove a theorem about global growth, which says that if a set is global, then it grows a lot when you multiply it uh, by itself. Uh, obviously, it's not true necessarily if it's not global. A can be just a subgroup. We know that SLNQ has subgroups and then it will not grow. But if it is global, uh, yeah, so a decoupled version. So now we have two sets, A and B. SL and Q. Uh, and suppose that they are both a maybe Q to some okay. zeta. Let's let's say that this is zeta. A Q Z, a Q to the zeta n global. So zeta is a small constant. Um, Okay, so we have two sets that are global. Uh, uh, if, okay, I'm kneeling now, but still it doesn't count. So if uh, the measures of this set is at least Q to the minus C N squared, okay, I'll go here. Then, um, uh, yeah, the, measure of the product. So you can get almost all things by just multiplying uh, an element of A by an element of B. So they can be quite small and still their product is quite large. So this is the global growth theorem. And as a corollary, you get that under the same conditions, if you take A and B and multiply them, and then multiply what you got by itself, then this is already everything. This is a, this is a standard exercise that, yeah. So in the global growth, what is your choice of R? Q to the four N, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So I practiced this, but. I don't know. It's supposed to be zeta, q to the zeta n, where zeta is a small constant. Not the same zeta as above. Sorry? It's not the same. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a new constant. Uh, maybe. Every set is q to the n global. What? Every set is q to the n global. Yes, right. That was my next comment. q to the constant times n is sort of like the, the right thing to expect or the issue that you should expect because every set is q to the n global each constraint like if you fix a vector and say this vector needs to go to that vector this reduces the number of matrices by a factor of q to the n uh, and so if you're just a subset of this set then still your measure grows only by a factor of q to the n uh, so so to be global they need to grow a little less than just being a subset of a, of a, of an umvirat so if it is a, in a subgroup uh -huh. then uh, uh you would say that it can it cannot be uh, good and about so it, it doesn't need so, to be a k umvirat right there are subgroups that are not k uh, well, in some sense, this proves that this cannot be because if there was a sub subgroup that was not a, yeah, so 
So that, that's a consequence of. Uh, yeah, so I guess, right, so I guess every subgroup uh, is a subset of an umbrella. Yeah. I guess. Well, under some group is not. What about like upper triangular matrix? Every, every sub, yeah, every subgroup, no, subgroup is on the globe. Upper triangular matrix is contained. Okay, right. Uh, so that, that statement uh, has a proof only via what you proved, or sorry, that statement you just made about every subgroup has a proof only via what you proved, or uh, I guess you can prove it in other uh, ways. I'm not so familiar with that. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if you think of, you know, I bet that if you think about it, you'll find something less, uh, something more direct than going through all the representations that it occurred. Um, okay. Um, right. Okay. So what is left? Uh, if A and B are global, think of B as A to the minus one, right? So if A is global, then also A minus one is global. And then A times A to the minus one is almost everything. And then A, A minus one, A, A minus one is almost everything. Uh, and we are not done because of the other case, which is where A is not global. Uh, so if, uh, so here's a, another theorem, uh, another structural theorem. Uh, if, uh, if same subset of SL and Q uh, is not uh, Q to the same zeta, and uh, global, uh, then we just, okay, what does it mean? It means that there is an umvirat where it is more concentrated. So we'll go into that one. And then if it's not, if it's still not global, we go further and so on and so forth. Eventually we'll find uh, an umvirat where it is global. And that's what I want to say. And uh, then it is global relative to uh, a good um, 2t umvirate for some t uh, so let's call it h this umvirat uh, so h is of the form c lt psi and also the measure of H is going to be the measure of A to some constant. And uh, together these, uh, these parts uh, complete the proof because you have a subset, uh, either it's global and then A, A minus one, A, A minus one gives you everything. Or if not, then it's global in some smaller uh, umvirat. And then when you multiply A by, by A minus one. Uh, okay. Uh, So when you multiply uh, a by a minus one, this is going to be a subset of, uh, so, or at least it's going to be dense in, it, it may also contain other things, but it's going to be dense in a h times h to the minus one. So h times h, h to the minus one is, you get C L uh, two, two T T and then psi, but then you multiply by H inverse. So psi minus one LT to the minus one, but it's a group LT to the minus one is the same thing. And then C to the minus one. And these things cancel 
and you got, just get C LT because LT times LT is LT, C minus one. So you get that A times A to the minus one is dense in a Grumbrot. Uh, and that's what we wanted. And that, so it's dense in a, in a Grumbrot. And then if you multiply it again by itself, you get all the Grumbrot and, and that's it. You have the theorem. Okay, right. So we have these four parts and one of them is just a definition. So there's not much left. Uh, the challenging part is this uh, global uh, growth part. Um, so, so I'll talk about this one, the rest of the talk. Um, how do you prove that the product of two sets is large I guess one option is to look at the convolution of the uh, of the indicator of these sets, the indicators of these sets. Uh, but for that, we need to say what the convolution is. Convolution. So if F and G are from SLN FQ, to maybe the complex numbers. Uh, and I'm interested in the case that F is the indicator of A and G is the indicator of B, but I'll, of course the definition is uh, general. So the convolution of F and, and G at a point X, remember that X is a matrix, uh, is defined to be the expectation over a random matrix in SL and FQ of uh, F of Y, G of inverse Y, X. That's the convolution. Um, and let's suppose that F is the indicator of A and G is the indicator of B and try to understand what we have here. So um, this expectation over y and y to the minus one x, the product of these things is x. And this is really just an expectation over random pairs whose product is x. Uh, so, and, and so I take two elements and if f of y is one, it means that y is in A. And if g of that is here, then it means that this is in B. And therefore I get a non-zero. So F convolution GX, if it is non-zero, it means that X belongs to the product AB. And if I want to show that the product AB covers everything, then one option is to, is to show that, uh, that the convolution of F and G is, uh, is more or less a constant function, hopefully that is not the, the zero function. If F convolution G is the constant function, it means even more. It means that uh, every, every element in the group is obtained more or less the same number of times as the product of A and B. So yeah, so, I, so in order to prove that A times B is almost everything, it's enough to show that F uh, convolution G is almost constant. Uh, and, and so the main maybe technical lemma that we need to prove is that uh, uh, if A and B are subsets of SL and Q and they are global again with that zeta times n thing parameter and uh, with density at least uh, same as before, q to the minus c and uh, n squared. Uh, then, right, so this is, these are the same conditions as the uh, global growth theorem. And then I want to say that the L2 norm So 
I take the expectation of F, the expectation of G, these are just the relative measures of A and B. Uh, and I take the difference from the convolution of F with, with G, then the two norm of that is bounded by some parameter, which is very small times the expectations of, of F times the expectation of G. Right, so, uh, right, so the difference between them is very small compared just to, uh, to the multiplication of the measures. This means that, F uh, that A times B covers almost everything. And we just need to discuss how this uh, can be proved. Um, OK, and, and for that, I need to tell you about representations. try to say the minimal information possible so that the experts are not bored and the non-experts are not uh, startled. So, so maybe start with uh, an exam you know, some examples that you know. So if G is a, bull, uh, a billion, group uh, then a function from g to the complex numbers can be written actually in a uh, in only one way as an uh, as a combination of characters where the characters come from this character set uh, and these characters have some relation to the structure of the group. Uh, if G is a product of stuff, then there is the F on Stein. F can be written as a sum of F equals S, where S is a subset of one to N. So something similar also holds uh, for a general a final a finite groups. So G finite group. Uh, so we know that a function from G to the complex numbers can be uh, written as uh, F equals sum over same as before, uh, G hat, but uh, now it's the set of uh, representations, not the set of characters, and they are uh, uh, usually denoted by rho or similar letters. And then I have the rho part of F. So this is a, a way to write functions over uh, non abelian groups. And again, the structure of these F rows is related to the structure of the, of the group. I'll, I'll say in a, in a bit, uh, a bit uh, more about that. So in general, the set of all functions from SLN FQ, this actually holds for any uh, finite group, can be written as an orthonormal, orthonormal direct uh, uh, sum of subspaces uh, W rho. Uh, and, uh, and F rho is just the projection of F onto this space W rho. And, uh, and rho, each rho is called an irreducible a representation. And W rho is called the isotyp isotypical uh, space uh, of this rho. Uh, and 
And so far, these are just names. I didn't tell you anything about the relation of all of this to the group structure, but that's coming. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, what, does, what are the relations of all these things to the group structure? So first of all, there is a relation between the group and the functions from the group to C. This relation is by an action. So SLN uh, FQ or any other group, it acts on L2 of SLN uh, FQ. Here is how, if I have a matrix psi, uh, it operates on a function from the left by giving us a new function. So psi of F will give at the point X, the value of F at the point chi times X. Uh, so this is just a shift, right? If I have a function over a group, I can shift it by an element of the group. That's what, that, that's what this action is. And actually you can also multiply F by psi from the right. That's another action. Uh, this will give at the point X, the value of X of F at the point X times Psi to the minus one, Never mind the minus one there. Um, and here is the relation to the group structure. Uh, the W rows, they are invariant under uh, the group actions. If you take a function from W rho and you apply any of the group actions with any C, it remains a, a function in, uh, in W rho. Uh, and actually, there are the minimal invariant spaces. Uh, below that, you just have the zero spaces. Uh, that's the, and that's a complete definition of, of these W rows. Sorry? Yeah, I hid that. Uh, right, so it's not clear what Turo is here, but uh, but somehow once you once you look at these minimal invariant subspaces, uh, each of them you can uh, partition it to spaces that are invariant just from the left or, or just from the right, and these are uh, and these are representations of the group uh, that are isomorphic to all. Uh, okay. And, uh, ah, okay, and one more thing, uh, important. I want to talk about the dimensions of the double rows. They make a lot of difference. So there is a dimension of rho, the, the, uh, which is, and it is just the square root so this, I, rho, for now, rho is not a subspace. I just define a dimension for it, and it's just the square root of the dimension of this actual subspace. Um, and yeah, okay, but how is this con uh, uh, related to uh, convolutions of functions? Well, you need to do uh, some work, but not too much. Um, oh, okay, sorry, before that, here is an observation. Uh, 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 for every row, the space W row is invariant uh, under uh, the group action. Why is that? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, under, sorry, right, group action I said, under uh, convolution. Convolution with the, with the function f, uh, but for any function f. If you uh, take a, a function here and you take the convolution with f, you get again a function from uh, w rho. On both sides, if you, yeah, if you want to be fancy. Uh, and the reason is that there is another way to look at the convolution, uh, if it 
well, at least if it remained on the board. Uh, yeah, so it was f of y times g of y minus one x, and there was some expectation here. Uh, so g of y minus one x is just a shift of g by y, by y to the minus one. So if g is from uh, w rho, this function is also from w rho. And I take a linear combination of such functions with weights that come from f. Uh, and so, yeah, and so this observation is true. And now, if you do a bit of work, uh, you get the, form the, the following formula. For the convolution of f with g. Uh, the convolution of f with g. So you're not supposed to see where it's true, but it's not far from where we are at, uh, right now. There, uh, there's not much to do. You can uh, partition f and g according to the row parts. So it's the sum of f rho part convolution g rho part. Uh, and you can do a little more to see how this is re related to what we want. There is one row in, par in particular which is interesting. We said that the constant functions, the set of constant, or maybe we should have said, the set of cons constant functions, of course, they are invariant under shift. So they form one of the uh, W rows. Let's call it WTR for W trivial. Uh, so you can write it as, uh, let's separate out the trivial representation. So we have F equals trivial, convolution G equals trivial, plus the sum of all the other rows of the same thing. And uh, the trivial part of F, what is it? It's the projection of F on the constant functions. It's just the average or the expectation of F, right? The, the projection of F on constant functions, it's just the average of F. So I have the expectation of F times the expectation of G, which is exactly what I want, plus other things that I don't want. Sum over rows of F equals rho, convolution G equals rho. And I would very like, very much like to show that these things are small. Um, right. So, so let's look at the norm of this thing. The norm of uh, f equals rho. Uh, I cannot change the market, but maybe I can switch to another one. Uh, so. It's okay. Uh, right, so I have this sum over all non trivial rows of the convolution between F rho and G rho. Uh, let's, I want to bound the norm of that. So, so let's just look at the, these norms. Um, and I, uh, well, how can I bound them? So, one way is to think of the convolution with the function as an operator. So this is the operator of convoluting with f equals rho applied to the function g equals rho. So the operator will be called t f equals rho perhaps. And so the norm of this thing is bounded by, so I have the same sum as before, uh, and, and I have the norm of the operator norm of t f equals rho times uh, the norm of g equals rho. Can you switch again then? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll try. Um, all right, so. All right, so. Uh, instead of f equals rho, I wrote the norm of the operator that convolutes with f equals rho, and then times the norm of the function g equals rho. And now I can do a fancy step 
uh, by that was first done by Sarnak in Zoo in 91, which is to evaluate this norm using a, 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 a how is it called? The, yeah, I want the trace norm. So you can you can uh, bound the norm of an operator uh, using the norm of its multiplication with its uh, conjugate, and its multiplication with its conjugate is uh, self-adjoint, and so you know you can uh, bound that norm using the eigenvalues, and the eigenvalues you can bound uh, using uh, the trace. And, and, and it turns out that you get a bound of the form. Uh, yeah, so the norm of this is bounded by uh, F equals rho norm divided by the dimension of rho square root. Yeah, and, I, and now I have to multiply by g equals o. Uh, this dimension is because I want eigenvalues, and I and this is this turns out to be the trace of this operator, uh, and the eigenvalues are bounded by the trace divided by the dimension, and there's a square root. Never mind. Somehow you ended up with like the fourth root of the actual subspace. It's the fourth root of the dimension, yeah, but, but truly the dimension of this is the square of the dimension of that. That's, so one is the square root of that, one is the square of that and the other is the square root of that. That's the right way to think about it. Well, so this thing also does correspond to some subspace. Yeah, so there is, a, yeah, there is an actual subspace here that I didn't mention, yeah. And it appears dim root times inside this subspace. Uh, okay. Did I, okay, have I made a, a uh, yeah, okay. So everything you did so far would work, but maybe this would not work in FQN or like where is the, so in FQN, the, this dimension will be one and you will have made no progress from here to here. You will just get the same thing. Ah, so this is the big one here. All right, yeah. So. It, yeah, so I want you to think that this is a big win that I got this dimension here, because if the group is very non-abelian, at least intuitively, you expect the dimension of the representations to be large. And, there, and, 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 there, and therefore, when I have this dimension here, I hope that it kills everything and I, I, and I get just a small number. And so, all that is left is that F uh, congruent G is the product of the expectations. Okay, so this is what I would hope. And also, it's sort of like the, the part that's more non abelian gets killed more, or something like that. Uh, yeah. There is, yeah, there, yeah, right. There, yeah, there is, yeah, there is something uh, to it. Yeah. Uh, somehow, the more non abelian part is the part where the dimension is louder and that gets even more killed. All right. So, so once I get here, what I would try, and uh, that is what you know, Gowers looked at it and, and, and called them the minimum dimension that appears here, he called the quasi randomness parameter of the group. And if this is large, then you're done uh, because this dampens everything. But what really happens, uh, at least in the case of SLN FQ, is that some representations uh, have small dimension. So this works with the representation of large dimension, but not for the representation of, uh, for the representations of small dimension. And I knew that it won't work. Uh, and so did you, because so far I didn't use anything about uh, globalness of the functions. Uh, so I guess I have time to just tell you the main <coughs> like idea of how to go, how to continue from here. And the general scheme is from, uh, let me see if I can say names without looking at my notes. Uh, not the correct order, but Kibash, Dor, and you, and no. Uh, let's see if I was right. 
Uh, yeah, I can't find it now in my notes. Uh, ah, sorry, yeah, Kiv Kivash lives in Tzadnitzvah. Yeah, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, so their scheme was uh, to take like ideas from analysis of well and function, functions and uh, assign, uh, so idea of how to continue is to assign a, a rank uh, for each uh, row. And the second step is to show that uh, rows with uh, high rank um, uh, have uh, high dimensions or let's say large dimensions right so this is the intuition that we just said if we are if if you are in a part that's very non abelian then the then the rank of uh, then the rank of row will be high and also the dimension of row will be high and for Uh, yeah, so it's not clear. Rank is for now just a saved name. Uh, I, I'll tell you what it is in a, in a second. It will just take a second, I, th I think. Uh, but anyway, for a rose of low rank, uh, we are going to show that the if you just project F on rows on, on, on all the sets W row, on the, the, some of the spaces W row where the rank of row is say smaller than D, then the norm of that uh, will be small compared uh, to the norm of the original F. That is going to be true if F is an indicator of a global set. So now we are using the globalness. So this is called the level D inequality for global functions. Okay. And this is the scheme. And now you just have to somehow assign actual meanings to the saved words and use some uh, results from uh, representation theory and other results. So. Uh, so okay, so the rank uh, of uh, the rank of representation. Okay, the rank of a representation is going to be the tensor rank, uh, which I'm not going to define, but I can tell you that representations of rank. This okay, I, I, I will tell you. Just a second. So first of all, it's called tensor rank, and I'm not going to give you the official definition, but basically, uh, rho is of rank one if W rho, the set of the set of functions, are just linear functions in the coefficients of the matrix. Right? Right? You have a functions over a set of matrices. As a SLN two FQ is a set of matrices. Uh, given, a, given a matrix, you can apply a linear function to the coefficients of the matrix. This is a, a function of rank one. Uh, and but all lives in C, right? It's all in C. Uh, right. So W rho is a space of functions. I didn't talk about rho at all. Right? I, I talked about W rho. W rho is a set of functions. And it's the and the sum of all W rows of over all rows of rank one is just a set of linear functions. And rank two will be just the set of uh, polynomials of degree two in the coefficients of the matrices, except the you you uh, you only take those who are uh, orthogonal to uh, those the functions that already appeared in rank one, and so on. So this is so rank is tensor rank, and I told you what it is. It's not really the way it is uh, officially defined, and the definition is from a, a, a paper of uh, Gurevich and Howe from uh, 2017. So that's 
fairly new. Uh, the dimensions of high ranks uh, is bigger. So uh, the dimension of, of W rho turns out to be bigger than uh, Q to some constant times N times the rank of rho. And this is a, an even newer result. This is Guralnik, Larsen, and Tiep. I'm probably not pronouncing anything uh, correctly okay. from 2020. What? I think all those guys say their names that way. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I had an intuition. Uh, and uh, and the uh, so yeah so these things are fairly new uh, and the D level inequality it's it's from basically from a paper I mean you need to make work but essentially to do some work but essentially it comes from a paper of Ellis myself and Noam from last year and that paper was about you know, this brings me to a question uh, uh, from before. That paper is not about SL and Q, it's about the set of the abelian uh, group of uh, matrices, N by N matrices. Uh, and there we proved the level D inequality, but level D was uh, defined completely differently. But still it turns out that the two, the two uh, uh, versions of, of ranks or levels, uh, they are not the same, but they are very, very uh, related, and we can use the result from the from the abelian group to our uh, to our case. So what, what did you use? What, what did you use? Uh, so what what we yeah, use yeah, is yeah. Uh, right. Uh, so we need this D level D level inequality. So what we use is a Bonami type inequality that I actually talked about in Beyond the Boolean Cube. Uh, a few weeks ago. And this one gives what gives you right. Yeah. So if you have like if you can if you can relate the high norms of low degree functions to the low norms, you can also get a bound on how much weight they have, how much weight Boolean functions have on their low degree part. Uh, and and in that paper that I mentioned, we proved a Bonomi type inequality for uh, global functions. I think they were not called global functions there, but that's what they were. They were, they were called global functions? Okay, fine. Yeah. Let's thank that again. So, can you do this graphic groups, like uh, syntactic groups? Uh, once someone asked Burgen if he if can do something in another case, and he said that he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm not Burgen. <laughs> <laughs> you get the same answer for many questions. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? So I, I do have a question. Yeah, so I mean, the other it's a union SLM Q where n is big and so Q is small. The other regime is when n is small and Q is big. So do you have any intuition about well, this? This could apply there. <laughs> this is this, this is for the quite a lot of this, right? Yeah, but yeah. But, yeah. yeah, but I'm saying that okay. So what is the right the right choice to ask? I don't know. What's the I don't know. It feel so like it's it's like when it's small, you know that eight to the power is everything. Yes. Uh -huh. So it's maybe when it's easier. Easier. It's easier. easier. So maybe a, when n is large, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Okay. It's like there are two obstacles.